trying to think what position you you could be in where you haven't received an email. If you only need... So I sent out emails for learning objectives one and two. So if you don't have credit for learning objective one or two, explain, then you've gotten an email from me last night. Uh, if you're waiting for LO3, I'll send those out shortly, but I want the one and two, LO1 and two to settle down first. And then uh, once I see what my schedule looks like after that, I'll send out for LO3. LO4, those makeup interviews are still with head TAs, I believe. I think they're this week. Uh, I'll confirm with them. Uh, so I can't send out emails for those yet. And LO5 haven't even happened yet with the first round of TAs. So I can't send those out with me. That's still in process. That won't be till finals week before I send those out. Yeah, that break was well needed and well deserved. Yeah, I'll agree with both points on that, Liam. Well deserved. I feel like we've all been through hell this semester. It didn't seem too bad at the start, but man, it just wears. What's up, UB Marcos Zianatri? What's up, P? <laughs> you grew a beard out of... So when I was... Back in my younger days, my beard wouldn't grow as good, but now that I'm older, I don't know, it, it uh, grows in more full. So give it time, you might get there. Need LO2 reading makeup? That'll be next week. Next week's lab. Am I on the right screen here? Oh, I'm at the bottom. We're at the bottom of the schedule. That's why I can't scroll down. Uh, next week's lab, you'll be able to make up any one, any, uh, not just any one, but any of the learning objective reads. You, if you still have to do all five of them, you can spend 10 hours of your Thursday and do all five of the labs that will be available in an extreme case. Last lecture week. And technically, I'll say that today is the last lecture day. Um, everything else after today, I gotta watch the clock. I'm not, I'm out of practice. I'm a week out of practice. So I gotta watch the clock and make sure we start on time. Uh, but after today, you'll have everything you need to get an A in the course. Everything else is bonus. Some of these topics were part of the course at one point and you'd have a big lab project and you do these things for that project. Uh, that's one thing that I scaled back. I turn it into project contribution because this course is just a bit much. And to do the rest of this is, uh, I don't know, I, I think you'll appreciate that scaling back. Uh, but anybody who still wants that content, who's still hungry for more, I still want to cover that content, even though I'm not really assessing it. Uh, but after today, those of you who are just here to get a grade and get through on with the rest of your lives, today's the last lecture you really got to pay attention to. Uh, and then just explicit review and whatever. Maybe I'll even cover more topics if nobody has questions for review. But yeah, last lecture day, I'll say. <clears throat> Self-quarantine, 12 days to go. Good luck. Stay healthy. Stay safe. What's up, Bite? Mango Mutiny? Why Wi-Fi? Hell is an understatement. Yeah, it's... It doesn't... I mean, I was complaining about it. I feel like it's a first world problem, but it, it's still, you know... Uh, there's a big psychological aspect to it that makes it a, a really serious problem. Shadow Connect, what's up? Yeah, I'll see ya. Nash CV, LO3. Oh, yeah, because I haven't sent... I was answering your question earlier. Yeah, I haven't sent them out yet, but I'll send them out soon. I sent out the LO1s and 2s. Monday Madman, you be Alex, Mothman's biggest fan. What's up, what's up, what's up? All right, I gotta get started with lecture. 116 lab speed run. Do we already have LO5 lab? That's this week. Uh, you you should be contacted by a TA with interviews. I I believe a lot of the TAs are still coming off of break. Like I was doing this morning, trying to um, still streaming again. Seems weird. Firing up OBS and I could see my face on my own computer. Feels weird because I haven't done this in a week. But once they all get into it, uh, you'll get the emails for the interviews for LO5. And Thursday's lab is, of course, the lab for LO5. Do we need two expansions to get an A? Yes. Yep, Padre. What's up, Trino? Project contribution is all about. That's what today's all about. Finally got caught up on all the lectures. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, I think there was a lot of catching up over the break. Unfortunately, most of you couldn't really have a break break. 
uh, neither could I. I was getting caught up on my own stuff. Um, but it, it feels better to be caught up. I'm almost at the end of my inbox. I only have a few emails. I have a few letters of recommendation to write. All right, but let's get started on this. Uh, did I? I didn't even download the slides yet. Okay, I got to remember how to do this. <laughs> I feel like it's only been a week, but I feel like it's been. Uh, I feel like it's been forever. Oops. Sure, replace it. I don't feel like opening Finder, or my computer, whatever it's called on this. Oh. All right. Trina, I'll grow the beard back. I, I just wanted to give it a break. I've had the beard for so long. I just, uh, on Monday of break, I was like, let's, uh, let's have a little change just for a little bit, but I'll just, uh, I won't shave for a while. By the end of the semester, you'll see a beard again. Why is home Wi-Fi worse than school Wi-Fi? School Wi-Fi is really good. And especially without thousands of students on campus, school Wi-Fi is blazing fast. Okay, let's do this. Yeah, more than 50 viewers. I assume, well, we're down to 41 already for some reason. But I assume mo more people are caught up with the lectures and are ready for the next one. So we I would expect more viewers today. So let's get on with it. Version control, I kind of very briefly went through these slides during makeup week. Um, but I ignored half the slides. I didn't really cover. I didn't really do justice. But now, since we have project contribution, actually, I want to start at the website. Since we have project contribution, we really need this content. So I want to talk about it with a bigger spotlight. So on uh, on the course website, I have these links in a few different places. So hopefully, no one misses them. Um, the project contribution and homework expansion logistics and what you have to do for those are all up. For homework expansion, I'm not logged in. I won't be able to really see them. Should I log in? No, because I'll get uh, duoed. I don't have my phone on me. Um, so homework expansion. If you've done one of the homework expansions, if you've either done a homework that you um, did an extra homework or one of the expansions, or preferably two out of all of that, let me know through this form. Let me myself and the TAs know, and then uh, we'll take care of the logistics from there. We'll either contact you for an interview, or we'll just review it and upload your grade to AutoLab. So let us know about your homework expansion objectives through this form. So I accidentally, accidentally clicked, um, and uh, anything that you've done. Just something I've gotten this question a few times. So just to make sure everybody hears this and that it's out in the clear, I put it on the form as well. But if you did not get a homework extension, if you didn't get an extended deadline for homework and you got a zero for that homework and you didn't complete that application objective, you can still complete that homework for an expansion objective as one of your two expansion objectives. So even if, say, you didn't get the expansion for Maze Solver, you can still complete Maze Solver by this deadline and submit it as an expansion objective and use that for one of your two expansions. So maybe, you, or maybe you got an expand, uh, ex, ex, an extended deadline, but you didn't quite finish it in time. You can still finish up whatever you have left and use that as one of your expansions. So, um, so everyone can still do any of the homeworks, uh, max of two for homework expansions, of course, review the syllabus if that doesn't make sense. Uh, and you still get those done. But what today we're talking about is project contribution. This link and this link up here are the same link. I just wanted it in a few different places so you can't miss it. Is uh, what we're doing for uh, for the last application objective, which y'all have been waiting for. I've mentioned throughout the semester, I'll mention this again today. This is the easiest application objective to complete. Nobody should miss this one. Uh, just get this done. Don't be... Don't be uh, uh, startled by the name of it. Project contribution and the framing can sound difficult at first glance. Contribute to an open source project. Sounds big. Um, don't sweat it. This is not This is by far the easiest application objective. Far easier than one of the homeworks. So make sure you get these, uh, these done. 
Will doing more than two expansions help your grade? No. Nope. It won't. Uh, if you're capable of doing more than two expansions, you probably have an A already anyway, because you've just been doing everything all semester. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to do want more than two uh, expansions because you would have just done the homeworks if you're capable of that. Uh, so there's two projects, and I don't give too much description on these projects, just a quick overview, because the state of these projects will morph and change over time. But I do give you a link to the repo for each, uh, each project. And your task is to contribute to one of these projects. These are hosted on a UBCSC GitHub account, a GitHub organization, which is kind of, you know, shared with all CSE is the idea behind that. Uh, so nobody's like the owner of these repos or whatever. You know, I have been managing them or, well, I haven't been doing as much as I want to, honestly, but I, I uh, intend to over this week. And uh, an office, a to-do scheduler, keeping track of tasks that you need to do. So a to-do list, a, a virtual uh, internet connected to-do list to mark the tasks that you need to get done. And an office hour system, which is a little different. Um, these days, it's a little, you know, slightly less relevant the way we have things now. So maybe that's part of your contribution is to change this into a, an online structure. But some way to queue up students for an office hour visit. And when we have IRL office hours, when we're in that common area in Davis Hall, it can just be a huge mess of students and TAs, and you don't know which TA is for which class and, you know, who your TA even is sometimes. Uh, so we want a system where you can go online as a student and say, I want to visit a TA in office hours. And then the TA has the other end of the app that says, hey, a student just joined your queue. And then the TA will call out your name. Hey, so-and-so when it's your turn so-and-so are you here and you go yep i'm here and then you get your office hour visit trying to streamline that process so that's the idea of the systems the very basic implementation of each of these is available in the repos and your task is to add a feature or add some code contribute some code to one of these two projects uh, i'll skip the structure for now we can talk about that at length over the next two weeks but i want to focus on the procedure. This is what we'll talk about today. Uh, to contribute code to these repos. Uh, so the big thing here is that you don't control these repos. You don't have access to them. You're not a contributor for those of you who've used GitHub. You're not a contributor on these repos and you won't be added as a contributor on these repos. So we have to create a pull request. Uh, we have to go through these five steps to be able to contribute code to one of these two repos. And once you contribute that code, your code doesn't have to be merged into the project. That would be on my end, reviewing hundreds of pull requests. There's already hundreds of open ones already. Um, it would be very time consuming. So you don't have to wait for me to do that. But once you create your pull request, I'll look at your pull requests and then I can mark you off for credit for this objective. Uh, but you have to contribute code to a project that you don't control, which is a common thing out in the, or there in, the, in the industry. There are a lot of open source projects that anybody can contribute to. And you might ask, well, if anybody can contribute to it, how do you control this code? If anybody can just throw any garbage in there, if they want to play a prank, just throw some you know, crap in a, uh, an open source project. Well, it's not allowed. It's because this is the procedure that we go through. There are code reviews. There's a whole process to be able to contribute to it. So the maintainers of the project control the code. And you basically, you create code, you add code to the repo, and then you basically ask for permission. Hey, can you add this into the main repository? And they'll either merge it in or reject it. So that's what we're going to go through there today, um, is the process of contributing to an open source project. So the code that you actually submit is, yeah, exactly, P. And with this, with this structure, you could contribute code to the Linux kernel following this process if you know assuming you have some code to contribute but it's the same process this is how we contribute to open source projects at least open source projects that are on github which is most of them um so the actual code you write i am not going to um i'm not going to have requirements on the actual code so the code you contribute I'm not going to have any strict criteria of what it should be. It should be valid code. It should work. You can't just add a comment. It has to actually be something that 
alters the project in some way. Um, but don't stress out over adding a lot of content. Unless you want to, some of you might want to contribute a, a larger contribution. Um, but if you just want to make a very small, minor contribution, that's going to be okay. I'm still going to accept that as your project contribution. So don't stress the code. Uh, and I really don't want somebody uh, putting a lot of work into this, thinking that's what they have to do, and then realizing that their friend got credit for doing almost nothing code-wise. Uh, you're both going to get credit. So I want to make that up front. Don't, uh, you know, don't stress yourself out with the actual code. We're focused on the process, these five steps. Can you follow these five steps? When it's actually writing your code and testing it, I'm not too concerned with that, but the code you contribute should work properly. Uh, no, it's it's fine if somebody else has the same idea. Uh, I'm I'm not gonna we're not gonna stress on that because even if you have the same idea, you both still have to go through the same process, and that's what we're focused on today. Can you go through the process of contributing code to an open source project? That's what we're focusing on. And yeah, if that seems a little watered down, it kind of is. The projects in the past have been extremely involved. One semester, two semesters ago, actually, uh, their project was to create an MMO JRPG, which didn't go great because that's an, an incredible task, to, an incredible undertaking. Um, so it didn't go super well. Most of the projects didn't work. So yeah, it's a lot different these days. But we're focused on the process instead of the product. If you want to, by the way, if you want to work on that MMO JRPG, that's that starter code that's in the examples repo. Since I mentioned that, I'll pull it up very quickly. Uh, if you're ever wondering what this project is, this is the skeleton that I gave for that MMO JRPG for them to start with. And, uh, and they had to build out the rest of this system. And it was a lot. It was also a group project, which I think has more downsides than benefits anyway. So, uh, And then when you're done, submit this form. Let me, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, let me know what your pull request is. Give me the URL to your pull request. The form will give you an example of what I mean, along with any comments uh, optional that you want to send to me. That you want to say, if you want to explain your uh, your contribution or something like that. Jesse gets free pizza. You know, if we were live, that's one thing I, I kind of miss is all the free pizza that we used to have in Davis Hall. We really can't do that. And I always used to get pizza for my TAs at the end of each semester. We can't, I don't know, it's one of the things I miss. I don't know, there's so much to miss, though. All right. So how do we do this? Let's talk about it. Version control. <laughs> the print line just... It has to... I believe I stated it explicitly in that doc. I didn't read it all to you, but... Uh, but it does have to... Your contribution does have to change the project in some actual way. Like, the an end user should see what you've done. Now, there are easy ways to cheese that, too, that are even easier than your print line. To be honest, if I'm being honest, but the print line doesn't add anything to the project. And I might as well just come out and say it. What uh, uh, The biggest cheese is just changing some of the HTML and CSS. Look, it's been a tough semester. We need You all need a break. Uh, that's the easiest way to get through this thing. But let's talk about the Git and the GitHub portions of this and how to create a pull request. So there are a lot of open source projects out there in repositories in GitHub, just like the two that you have uh, that you that are for your project contribution and you want to contribute to these. But how do we share code as developers? How do we share code amongst ourselves? And if we're working as a team on a single project, how do we all work on that same code base? There are a lot of options here, a lot of bad options. Send the code as email attachments. Uh, Submit to Autolab to share code with me. That is one thing that we actually do. Or uh, Google Docs can work. We like using that for text to collaborate on text, but it really doesn't work for code very well. Dropbox can work. Y you know, it it's used to share files like that. Uh, but really, again, not meant 
for code. It's what's part of one of the oh, I think I missed something. No, project contribution is an application objective. It's nothing to do with learning objectives. So the that, and that's one of the reasons I don't mind making the project contribution so easy is it's it's there to improve your letter grade by one. Uh, it, it's not part of the learning objective. So to make take advantage of the project contribution at all, you still have to do all five of your learning objectives. So if you've already done all five of your learning objectives, the project contribution is kind of that free little boost to your to your grade. And even then, some students miss the project contribution. Don't be one of those students. I have students right after the deadline each semester. Uh, I forgot to submit or whatever. I didn't fill out the form, but I did the pull request. You know, silly stuff like that. Just don't be one of those people. Uh, and you'll get this free uh, free boost to your letter grade. After doing all the learning objectives, you deserve at least one little uh, one boost that's not too difficult. Uh, so we don't use any of those technologies. We use Git. You're already uh, fairly aware of Git because uh, we use it for the code repo. Uh, the examples repo, we use it for every single homework assignment. You've used this significantly to, uh, no pun intended here, but to get code from me. That's how I distribute code to you. But we want to use this to, for you to share code with me is the difference that we're doing here. And this is designed for code, unlike those other technologies. And, um, and it's a way to track all the changes, excuse me, made to a code base. So this has, uh, we call this version control, but it's also source control. Version control, whenever you see version numbers in software, that's what we're talking about with version control. Yeah, Linus, Linus Torvalds, he's uh, a legend. He made not just Git, but the Linux kernel. So a little history, they were, Linus and his team working on the Linux kernel, which runs all of, you know, all the Linux operating systems, Linux-based operating systems are all based on that kernel. Uh, they were using, geez, I don't even remember what they were using for version control, but Linus didn't like it. He's like, I'm sure I can make something better than this. And then in, I believe, a weekend, he made Git, and it turned out to be better than any, any other version control. And that's what basically the entire industry uses today. There are other options, but Git, especially being freely available, there are a few um, closed source version control, so, you know, closed source, source version control software out there. Uh, Git being free, open, you know, it took over. Yeah, if I there are some quirks with Git. I kind of wish he would have spent like a week or two on it. Maybe made it a little more user friendly. But hey, I ain't complaining. He shared it with us all, so um, I'll take what I get. Uh, so version control. When I receive these version numbers, Git is uh, is great at doing that. That's where it gets its name from for version control. Why it is that? But we mostly use it also for source control. It's tracking every change that we make anytime somebody changes the code. It's going to remember that. Git will always remember. Um, one of the the sayings is Git never forgets. Git will always remember every change that was made to uh, to that code, who made that change, what files were changed, which lines were changed, and you can also roll back changes. There's a lot of power that we we can do with Git. A lot of things, a lot of powerful things that it can do. But really, tracking all the changes that have ever been made to a code base is the way to to sum this up. And uh, also what we'll talk about later is branching, which creates different copies of the code so we can change the code without affecting other branches, other parts of the code. So if we have two copies of the code base, we can change one without affecting the other is uh, a quick summary of branches. And uh, oh yeah, and if two people change the same file, Git has a way to merge those changes together. It'll give you an, um, uh, some extra markup in the files, and you'll be able to merge those all those changes together. Just something you won't have to worry about for this project contribution, since you're only pushing code to me, and then it would be on me to merge. That's why you'll see a lot of open pull requests, because merging them all would be a nightmare. I do want to pick through some and start merging some, but um, it's one of those things that's always on my to-do list. next semester homework uh, contribute to improve Git. you know i always want to have assignments like that where you actually go to open source projects not in 116 but in 442 
And uh, I had it as an optional assignment once. I think there were only two students who did it, and they just submitted garbage to some actual repo with actual developers, a development team, analyzing that and giving them feedback. And then they're like, I just did this for an assignment. It's Whenever I have students interact with the real world, it doesn't go well. Um, but I would like to do things like that. It just doesn't work. Should I expect... You'll get an email from me, Nash. Didn't you just ask me that? <laughs> yeah, I'm sheltering you. Well, I'm sheltering the rest of the world from you. You guys are dangerous. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, so this is a kind of a pictorial version of Git. You have your repository stored on a server, and for our purposes, GitHub. And then you clone that repository, create a, an entire copy of the repository on your local machine. And then you can edit that repository at will, and then push your changes back to the repository. So everybody can have their own entire copy of this repository, including all the versioning, all the history, every change that's ever been made to the code base and uh, and not affect anybody else's work. So there's a few layers to that. There's a lot of things that GitHub does or Git does to prevent you from affecting other people's work. Uh, the repo isn't private, the ones that you're editing, but you don't have access. You don't have write access to it. You do have read access or <laughs> wildcards. Uh, and there are a few commands. We're not going to use git through the command line, but I do at least want to make you aware of these commands because uh, they will be called by IntelliJ. And also, it's part of the terminology with git. Even if you're not typing these commands in the command line, maybe you don't even know what the command line is at this point. But, uh, uh, but it's useful to be familiar with all these terms. So I want to go through these. I had a slide on each one. I thought that was a bit much, so I got rid of them. So I want to just briefly talk about each one of these in this one slide. So if you create an entirely new repo from scratch with no content in it, that command is init. You initialize a new git repo. To update a repo, there are three parts to updating a repo. You add files to the uh, to your local, to your actually to your index of your local copy of your repo. You commit those changes to the local copy of your repo. So thinking of this picture, you commit changes to your local copy of the repository after you make changes. So you make changes, you add those files, which means you tell Git that you want these files to be tracked and added to the repository. Then you commit changes to those files to your local copy of the repository. And then finally you push those changes Oh, I clicked on the image. So those images are linked if you download the slides. Oops. Uh, if you download the slides, those images are linked to uh, to the sources. That's what happened. I accidentally clicked one. So and then you finally push your changes to the remote repository. It's very important that you do all three of these. IntelliJ will do adding for you. The files that you are editing will be are already added to the repo. But if you do create a new file, uh, again, IntelliJ should add it for you. But if it doesn't, the text will show up as red text. And then you have to right click it and explicitly add it. But that shouldn't be something you have to worry about. Committing and pushing, you definitely do. You have to both commit your changes to your local copy of the repository. But you also have to push them. If you commit without pushing, you will never see those changes in GitHub. You have to push if you want anyone else for our context here, if you want me to see your changes so I can give you your grade, you have to push to the repo. So if you go into GitHub and you don't see your changes, it means you didn't push. Even You might have committed, you might have added, but if you didn't push, I can't see your changes, and you won't see your changes in GitHub, and there'll be nothing to, uh, to add to my repo, to the uh, UBCSE repo. If you want to create a complete copy of a repository, you clone. This is what you do every time you get a, a homework assignment. You go into IntelliJ, you clone that repo. Uh, that's what you're doing. You might, it might not use, I don't believe it uses the word clone in IntelliJ, 
but that's what you're doing when you get a remote repository and uh, you clone all that code into your local machine. And then finally, pull. Whenever I update the examples repo, you pull to get the latest changes in your local copy of that repository. And one of the mantras of Git is pull often. You always want the latest changes in your code. Hopefully you've all been pulling the examples repo often. I'll sometimes tweak examples. I'll add new examples from time to time. Not too much this semester compared to other semesters, but it's still important to pull often, always get that latest stuff, especially I would pull right before each lecture. Sometimes I update the lecture examples right before lecture. Um, I guess that's not too relevant anymore, but hopefully you've been doing that all semester. Yeah, IntelliJ has embedded Git. If you have a Windows machine, I believe you still have to install Git. I, I'm actually I'm actually not 100%. Did I have to install Git on this machine? I don't remember. But if Git doesn't work on a Windows machine, you might have to install Git. I don't know if IntelliJ does have embedded Git, if it installs it for you or not, or if it just links to your local version of Git. You think you did have to install it? So you might have to, on Windows machines, you might have to install it. On Linux and Mac OS, Git is pre-installed on those operating systems. Windows, I don't know Windows. Get it together and just come with Git installed. What's Docker file language? That's a topic for another day. Because uh, I want to get through this. Um, but Docker file, I don't know if I have a quick one-liner, but it, it simulates virtualization. Uh, it's probably the very quick one-liner. So every time you commit code, you're going to have to add a message, a commit message to that commit, which ideally should be a meaningful description of the code contributed in that commit. So whenever you make changes, you're done with those changes, at least for the moment, you commit them to your local repository, you add a commit message, and hopefully that message means something because um, if it doesn't, it's gonna be hard to tr go back and track changes if you have a bug later on in the code, in a specific part of, part of the code that's causing an issue, and you want to go back through history and see where that code came from, and more importantly, why that code exists. Maybe it's something that you would rather just delete and get rid of, but you want to know why that code is there before you delete it or something like that, uh, or do some make some changes to it. So you go back, and the commit message says, here, have code. Well... That doesn't really help you in that situation. You're going to be mad at whoever wrote that commit message. And more often than not, it's probably going to be you who wrote that commit message, and you're going to be mad at your past self. It happens a lot in programming more often than uh, uh, than we any of us want to admit. But we get mad at our past selves a lot. So it's better to have meaningful commit messages that describe the code that's being committed. And, uh, well, I don't need to talk about it too much. Uh, in GitHub, GitHub is a remote server now owned by Microsoft that will host our Git repositories for free. It'll be our remote host that stores our repository and then gives us a nice web interface to be able to interact with those repositories. GitHub is not the same as Git. You can use Git without GitHub. You can't use GitHub without Git. GitHub is just a server that takes advantage of Git to be able to do what it does. And what it does is give us gives us free server space, so we have no reason to complain. But it's become really the central uh, location where open source projects live, and also closed source projects. You can create private re repositories of closed source projects on GitHub too. Um, but if you use that quite a bit, they often want money, which is how they survive. Well, now they survive because Microsoft, but that's how GitHub survived before Microsoft is paid uh, paid accounts. Uh, all right. Do you think Microsoft uses Linux to run GitHub? I would imagine so. I would think so. Uh, because they didn't write GitHub. If they wrote it from scratch, I'm sure they, they'd probably be forced to use Windows servers. Um, but I would imagine GitHub before Microsoft ran on Linux, you know, like, like most software does. Uh, most uh, most servers do anyway, from my experience, at least. Is it a cat or an octopus? It's an octopus. Or is it a cat? A catopus? Maybe it's both. Uh, 
So let's talk about branching. There are a few more topics. I forgot when this ends. 2.40? 20 minutes? Okay. Yeah, because we start at 1.50. Yeah, yeah. I I'm remembering. I, I got this. I'm not on break still. So let's talk about branching. I mentioned this briefly earlier. This is a way to create an entire copy of the code base that you can alter, that you can change without affecting anybody else who's working on that project. So if you want to add a new feature to a project, you would create your own branch, work on that feature, finish it, test it, most importantly, and then get it merged back into the original repository. So how do we exactly do that? I mentioned master branch before introducing it, but it's right here. It's not right here. How much of this do I want to talk about without introducing master? I'm fine with all that. So, uh, so with branching, we have branching. Okay, you can create a copy of the repository. A copy, I put that in quotes on purpose. It doesn't actually copy the entire code base. That's one of the beauties of Git is that it, uh, it'll share everything. It builds a tree-like structure uh, with where each commit is like a node that references the next commit or the previous commit rather. Um, and when you create a new branch, you just create a new branch that refers to the commit that you branched off of. And then each commit is just the changes. So if you follow all the changes of the tree, you can build the entire code base. Uh, but Git is very smart about not duplicating storage of your code. So it doesn't actually create an entire copy, but from our perspective, that's what it does. So there are two uh, really main branches in a Git repository, at least using this specific branching model that I'll talk about, which is used quite widely these days is uh, you have one branch master. This is part of Git. When you create a new repository, it'll create a master branch for you with a lowercase m. I, I capitalized it because it was the first word here, but I shouldn't have. Uh, master is the branch that's created when you create a Git repository. Some repositories just only use this branch. If you've used Git before, you might have only used the master branch and not done any branching. And that's fine if you're just using a work on a project by yourself. You know, it's, uh, it's okay to do. Still not the greatest thing for reasons we'll talk about. Uh, but master is only used for stable releases. Again, you can branch any way you want. This is just a kind of industry standard. Master is only used for stable releases, and it contains the code that's currently released to your users. So every, every uh, commit made to master should have a new version number and a release made to the end users. So master doesn't change very often. It's only changing when you're releasing code to your users. The develop branch is the next main branch in a repository. These two branches will live as long as the project lives. These will never be deleted. These two branches always exist. Develop contains the latest, greatest cutting edge features that are complete and part of this project, but haven't been released yet to the users, or, or I should say including features that haven't been released yet to users. So these might need to still be tested. They might just be waiting for the next release date or whatever. Uh, for some, for a lot of open source projects, you can actually get the development version of the project. That means you're getting whatever's on the develop branch, which is fresh, brand new features that uh, you know may be a little bit, bit buggy, that haven't been released yet, haven't been merged yet into master. They renamed master domain. Did they really? No, not the, I guess not the update. Uh, and pictorially, this is what it looks like. You have your two branches, master and develop, where um, master, you have very few changes happening to master. You'll branch, uh, each dot here is a commit, I should mention. You'll commit your changes to develop. Well, not directly, as we'll talk about in a second, because of slavery connotations, AIC. It makes sense. I don't, I don't know. When I hear master, I just think of Git and branching these days. But yeah, I, I can see that. Uh, so we commit to develop. And, uh, and whenever we merge a new word, 
into master we'll, master will get all of these new changes and then we'll have another release to our users so master we're never changing directly and in a second we'll see that develop we actually never change directly either <clears throat> next is feature branches these are temporary branches this is where the actual work gets done so to create a new feature to add code to a code base We'll branch off of develop, so we create a copy that's a complete, exact copy of whatever's on develop, the latest features that are complete, and then we'll write our code there, add all our changes to that branch, then when we're done and tested and we're happy with everything, we'll merge that into develop, meaning we want all the commits that I made on this branch, all the new commits, I want all those commits to be on develop as well, so develop will have my latest feature that I just wrote. You hope it doesn't break. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. If one of your, you'll have all your stuff tested, but if one of your teammates also added a feature to develop, your features might be incompatible with each other. So things might break. That's why we don't do this right on master and release it immediately to, or main. Uh, that's why we don't release it to our users right away. We wanna make sure that all of our new features work well together, that they all integrate well and don't break. Uh, so that's what we do on develop. Um, and if uh, if your feature if a feature doesn't work you or you had a very experimental feature and it's not going to be finished for whatever reason you just delete that branch without merging to develop no harm done everyone moves on uh, and pictorially branch off of develop get all of the current state of develop add your new commits and then merge your new commits into develop. And if we look at the whole picture, we have our version releases on master. We branch to get develop off of that. We have a few different branches that we don't need to talk about today, but I wanted to show the whole picture. And you'll have multiple team members working on feature branches and then merging those into develop whenever they're done with their current features. Uh, the rest of these are preparing for a release, polishing everything up. And when you release a bug to your customers, you would create a hot fix right off of master, fix the bug, and then merge that into master and develop uh, for when you have those bugs that get out to your, uh, to your customers. Okay, but branching, you can only do in repositories that you are a contributor on in GitHub, at least. You have to have access to that repository. You have to be able to make changes. You need write permission to be able to create a new branch. You can't create a new branch if you don't have control over that repository, which means you can't create a new branch on the repositories that you need to contribute to for your code contribution. You can't create a new branch on those repositories because you're not a contributor on those repositories. So how do we do that? How do we... How the hell do we contribute code by creating a branch and then merging this branch when we don't have access to that branch? For that, we're going to use a fork. This is a GitHub feature, not a Git feature, where you can com create a complete copy of a repository under your GitHub account. So this is different from cloning a repository. You create an entire GitHub repository on your local machine. Forking means you're creating a copy on your GitHub account. So once you create a, a copy on your GitHub account, now you have complete control over that repository and you can do whatever you want. You can create branches, commits, pushes, do whatever you want to that repository. It's your repository. It just happens to be a complete copy of a repository that you have read access on. So any public repository, you can create a fork of it. If you want to create your own fork of the Linux kernel and start making changes to it, uh, to your repository, your copy of it, go ahead. No one's stopping you. Uh, and when you... Fork a repo, you can create your branch, clone the repo, edit that branch, push to that branch, and then we have to somehow get that change back into the original repository. And for that, we can use, oh, I'll demo it, uh, we can use a pull request, which is a request to the maintainers of that repository 
to merge your code into it. And it still trips me up. I still think it should be called a push request that I'm requesting that this code be pushed into your repository. But I guess you're requesting that they pull it into to their repository. Oh, the naming always tripped me up on that. Um, but you would create a pull request to merge the changes that you've made to your forked repository into the appropriate branch of the repository that you're trying to change. For our case, is the develop branch in the original repository. And then if the maintainers accept that, they can merge that code into their develop branch in our case. And that change will be affected on the original repository. So let's, in 10 minutes, we can do this. See a, oh, and here's, if you're interested, here's the, oh, that's, that's the wrong article anyway. You'd have to click on one of the other images. Um, so let's see a demo of this in action. In 10 minutes, I can get, I should be able to get through this whole thing. So here we are on the Office Hours repo. Obviously, I have access to this so I can create new branches uh, right here. But we're going to pretend that I don't have access to this repository. So I'm here at the Office Hours repository, the one pointed to from as to-do scheduler, but you get the idea. Um, but I have this repo, and I don't have access to it. So what I'm going to do is navigate my mouse right up here and create a fork of this repository. I'm already logged in, so it knows who I am. It knows that I mean I want to fork this on, uh, well, of course, I already forked it, <laughs> that I want to fork this to my account. So I've already forked this, so there's nothing else to do. I'm just going to go to my fork of this repository. So once you create that fork, you're going to have the, the same repository, but under your account. So now you have full access, of course, and uh, it's going to be your GitHub username. I should mention, if you don't have a GitHub account by now, uh, you're going to have to create one. And whatever your username is, that's what you're going to see up here. If you're at the original repository, you're going to see UBCSE slash office hours or to do scheduler. Once you have your cloned repository, it's going to be your username here. Now, I want to edit some code here. So I'm going to go do the same thing that you do when you clone the homework assignment code is grab that link. You should all be very familiar with this. I'm going to go into IntelliJ, go to version control. Uh, you can't see the drop downs. I'm going to go to version control. It's going to be a little blurry, but uh, I mean, you've done this a hundred times anyway. Version control, get. Uh, version control, sorry. Get from version control. Paste that URL and click clone. It does use clone. It's already, already exists. If you ever get that error, it means you already cloned it. I'm just going to put a two here. It's the simplest thing to be able to get a different directory name clone the repository, meaning I make an entire copy of that repository on my local hard drive. So I have this, I'm going to close my other IntelliJ. So I can make this bigger. And I have the code for this, uh, this repository, you have to do the usual things. That you do ooh, do i do i say mark src should be mark scala as uh as the source's root so this is a little different uh set up your sdk if you have to 1212 21212 cool there's defender i don't care get i don't care and now i have the uh the code for this project in all its glory i should be able to run it I should be able to run it. Compiling, compiling. I should be able to open. Should be able to enter the queue, hopefully. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to ignore that for now. So since, uh, since I don't know what changes I made to this, I probably have... Uh, I probably have some changes that, uh, actually I can fix this quick, can I? No, I can't because I committed them. Anyway, so I'm going to go to my code. I probably broke this in some way is, uh, is what I'm saying. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head on this specific machine what I changed and, and everything. But I don't have a fresh copy of the repository right now. So then I make some changes. Please make a more meaningful change than this. But there's my change. It's beautiful. And uh, I tested it. I'm happy with it. And now I want to get this change into my GitHub repository. <laughs> I know it is bugging me being red. Let's... Uh, Some, at least that compiles. So I made this beautiful change, and I want to commit and push this to the repository. It's already added, and I can see this blue over here. Uh, that means that this file has been changed, and that change is not yet committed. So what I'm going to do is click this little check mark here, this magical button that, does, that makes Git a lot easier to use. By the way, this is the button to pull. So if I have changes on the server that I want to pull, hopefully you've been doing this with the examples repo all semester, I would click that button. When I want to push, commit and push, I click this button. It's going to show me a summary of the changes I've made. It's going to prompt me for a commit message. message. And you can click commit. Don't make this mistake. You can click commit. But if you do, it's not going to push. If you click the drop down and click commit and push, it's going to both, of course, commit and push. Ah, crap. You don't see the window. Thanks, Juicy. Uh, so you'll see this. You'll see this pop up. Oh, come on. Oh, I see. I see. And then I can't, okay, I might have just have to look over here. So you're going to see this window, which is going to give you a summary of your changes and a lot of other options that you don't need to worry about. I never do. Uh, just ec extra things that it, you want IntelliJ to check before you commit. And I just type this commit message. This is where you're going to add whatever commit message you want for, uh, for your commit that you're pushing. And then this button, this is what I was saying. It says commit. If you click that, it's going to do exactly what it says. It's just going to commit. You need to commit and push. If you use this drop down, commit and push, that's what you want. I wish that were the default, but it's not. That's not the world we live in. So commit and push is what you want. So you want to drop that down and click commit and push. I'm going to just commit because I want to show you what happens when you just commit and how to fix it. So I'm going to not listen and I just click commit. Now that change has been committed to my local copy of the repository. But if I go to GitHub and I, oh, I didn't branch. I mean, a lot of students don't branch either. So, uh, so if I go to my commits, I'm not gonna see that commit because I never pushed it. So you're not gonna see that commit because I only pushed, I didn't, or I, I only committed, I didn't, push to the remote repository. So I can't see that change on GitHub because that's a copy of the repository on the server. I only committed to my copy of the repository on my hard drive. So if I made that mistake and I click commit instead of commit and push, go to version control, git, push. Push. It's going to say push worked great because nothing goes wrong in a live demo. Thankfully, it said push white great. And now I can see my commit in GitHub. Once I can see it in GitHub, I know everything worked well here. And now that I'm happy with my code, 
I'm ready for a pull request. Time to demo in the CLI. I've done a live demo CLI, a Git demo. I was so proud of myself. It was when I first started. I was so proud of myself because it all worked well. I'm in a lecture hall with hundreds of students and and uh, nothing went wrong. I was shocked that nothing went wrong. It was dangerous to try something like that. Uh, something always goes wrong. But anyway, I'm ready for a pull request. So I'm going to click this pull request. And I'm going to make sure that I'm pulling, creating a pull request for the appropriate place. I'm creating a pull request from my develop branch of my copy of this Office Hours repo into the develop branch of the UBCSE Office Hours repo. Since you uh, create a pull request off of my repo and the off the UBCSE repo, I should say, and the default branch for that repo is develop. Develop should be selected already. If you want a different one, there's a drop down here. You can select a different branch. If you created a new branch, which I should have done, I skipped that step, but I don't grade you based on that anyway. So if you push right to develop your develop, you know, that's fine too. You're going to get your grade for it. Um, but make sure you're pulling from the correct branch. And then I'm going to create pull request. I can add a comment. Oh. Oh my goodness. Can't type anymore. Create a title, create a message. I don't have any requirements on what you have here. Try to make it meaningful if you added a, an interesting contribution and then create pull request. When you create the pull request, you're gonna have a URL which is for your pull request. Copy that URL, go to the form, the submission form, paste that URL right in that form. That's how you submit. I have no way of knowing what your GitHub ID is. I only know your UBIT name. So when you submit the form, it's going to associate your email address. It's going to collect your UB email address and associate that with your form submission, which is associated with your pull request, which is associated with your, uh, your GitHub ID. So that way I know that that's your pull request. So submitting the form is you saying, hey, that's my pull request. So you have to submit that form. I, there's nothing I can do if you don't submit that form because I will have no idea that that pull request was actually from you. Even if it's your actual real name, like I'm not going to look for every pull request that's not affiliated with a form submission. Like just submit the form. Don't be like a few handful of students last semester uh, panicking because they, they were missing credit on the easiest thing. And I don't even remember what I ended up doing with them. I need to create another GitHub account. And, uh, and if you look at this repository, there are all the pull requests from last semester. You can see all the, the low effort, mo uh, mostly low effort, but a lot of really high quality ones that I do want to merge in, which maybe I will do over the last few, few days. But I meant to do that over the last few months too, and I still haven't. Um, but hopefully now that this is more relevant, it's uh, that I'll start doing that. And then I'm caught up on things. So that is... Oh, the one, one more thing. I know I'm a, a little bit over... So very quickly, if I'm in my fork of this repository, this is where you would, maybe I should add this next semester as a requirement. Uh, I, I might technically this semester, I forget if it's in the doc, but create a branch. To create a branch, go to the branch that you want to branch off of. So say I'm on this branch, but I want to branch off of develop. I was already on develop. Switching branches, you just select the branch. I want to branch off of develop. Just type your new branch name and hit enter. I just created a new branch. If I go into IntelliJ, I can see all my branches down here and I can actually see my new branch I can check it out, which means I want to switch over to that branch. I can make changes to this branch.
going to just update it. I can... I'll do an IntelliJ, I guess. I can switch back to... Oops. Back to develop. I can take my new branch. This stuff is just extra. I should have announced that this is the end of lecture. That's the official end of lecture. That's all you need for your project contribution. Then I can say merge that into this branch. And then when I merge, that only affects my local repository. So I do have to push. And then if I go into my code, go back to develop, that change is actually made on develop. I can look at my commits. And that commit that I made on the other branch now does show up on develop because I merged that into develop. All right, yeah, officially the end of lecture. We're just chatting now. It's good to be back. Let's do this two more weeks. And we could be done. <laughs> we'll be done with this semester. Is it really that bad? Um, but I don't know off the top of my head on this specific machine what I changed and, and everything. But I don't have a fresh copy of the repository right now. So then I make some changes. Please make a more meaningful change than this. But there's my change. It's beautiful. <laughs> and uh, I tested it. I'm happy with it. And now I want to get this. <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm not going to mention about merge conflict. I mean, I can right now if there's demand for it, but uh, you know what? Maybe, maybe that's what I'll play with. So maybe I'll just do this on stream. So there are, of course, a lot of pull requests here. I want to start merging some of these pull requests into master. And once I start doing that, then you will start seeing merge conflicts. You do not have to resolve any merge conflicts as part of your project contribution, but it is a reality of when you start, you know, when you work on stuff, uh, work on projects and collaborate on projects. So they have a Andrew Paul. It is. Oh, I don't. I don't know if I want to rant about this one right now. But the next semester, it's a fourteen-week straight semester, not a fifteen-week straight semester. I keep seeing people say fifteen weeks. It's fourteen. If it was fifteen. We can manage. I can manage a 15 week straight semester uh, because then I can just build in a week of slack in my schedule for each course. But since it's a 14 week, I still have to keep up the pace. Like, I still have to keep moving every semester. Uh, like, if they just canceled spring break and said, no, you have to stay here for spring break, you know, I'm just going to scatter a week's worth of, you know, slack time or, or whatever, or maybe just have a makeup week built into the schedule like I did this year semester. I did it kind of on a whim, uh, but I could have two makeup weeks. You know, there are things I could do with a 15 weeks semester, but they added a week to fall break or sorry, to winter break. So winter break, I believe is seven weeks now. And we get that extra week when we don't need it to take away spring break when we do need it. So I still have to push all my students through 14 weeks nonstop where with no extra time in the schedule to work with it, it's just it's going to be tough uh, and in courses like 312 uh, I, I can manage because I'm just going to take a week out <laughs> and, and you know who's going to stop me uh, but in 116 when all the content we cover is required you know, it's just a lot tougher. This course already moves at a pretty quick clip. So taking away any catch-up time, I don't know, it's going to be tough. I'm going to try to rework the schedule to get a at least a makeup week in there, but man, it's tough. And I'm sure a lot of courses that you're going to take won't make any changes. They'll just treat it as a regular semester, which I can't blame them for, but that probably will happen. Yeah, merge conflicts are going to happen a lot. 
if, when you do come across merge conflicts, don't do what some 442 students do and just force a push. Just say, no, my changes are the ones that need to stick and my teammates changes, just delete those. Don't, don't be that person. Don't be that teammate. People get mad. And rightfully so. Yeah, they basically move spring break to the first week of class. To the first week of the semester. Burnout will be real. You thought this semester was tough? I thought this semester was tough. Next semester... I mean, I want to say that we'll all be more experienced with an online format, but I don't think it works that way. I think the online format is just going to keep continue to wear us down. I mean, we'll make it through. I don't know what we'll be like on the other end. How many days off do we get for spring now? Zero. That's the problem, Keenan. <laughs> Uh, technically two, if you count a weekend in there. But they took away spring break. <laughs> April 1 burnout is going to be the biggest fool of them all. Oh, actually, I want to... Do I want to... Yeah, I won't. Macy's Juniors told me 220, 250 are pretty manageable. I mean, they're manageable. So 220, 250 is very similar to 116 in the sense that they're manageable. And dare I even say somewhat? I don't want to say that. But they're definitely manageable if you really understand the material from the previous courses. So like 116, I think, is a manageable course. If... You understand all of the material in 115. If you know the crap out of loops and data structures and iteration, uh, um, if you know all the topics from 115, you come into 116 ready and prepared. Uh, it's a manageable class. It's still difficult. You know, it's still a big, a large amount of work, uh, but that work isn't too difficult if you're prepared for it. If you're keeping up with lectures, if you're, you know, just knowing all the background material that you need. Um, same with 22250. If you're comfortably getting an A in 116, 22250 aren't that bad. It's the students who get Bs and Cs in 116, just barely squeak by, barely get their lecture questions done, manage to pass the interviews and snag a couple of application objectives. It's those students who are really, who tend to struggle a lot in 22250, just like it's the students who get squeaked by with a C or a B in 115 that do terribly in 116. So I actually ran some numbers on this. It's all preliminary data. But when I did the midterm grades, anybody who got worse than, I believe, a B, so B minus and below in 115. 80%, I believe it was 80% were failing by the midterm in 116. On the other hand, anyone who got a B and above was, you know, overall were doing really well in 116. But if you don't have the background material that we assume that you know because you took the prereq, you registered for our course, you have to know the stuff in the prereq. Uh, if you know the stuff in the prereq, these courses aren't that bad. They're designed to to push you along in a pretty steady path but if you you know if you missed a whole concept like if you missed event-based architectures but somehow squeaked by the learning objectives 220 is going to be difficult because you're going to talk about concurrency at a very low level you're going to be creating your own you know i don't know the specifics of what he does but you're going to do a lot more low level concurrency and if you don't even understand, if you couldn't even understand message passing, and you're just not going to understand that stuff. Or maybe you will, but it's going to be a lot more difficult, I should say. And then you're going to complain, this is a weed out course. Well, did you study 116 over winter break? The parts that you didn't understand? If you didn't, then yeah, we're weeding you out. If you didn't study 115 over the summer to prepare for 116 to make sure you knew all that material inside and out, if you just took your C and then did no computer science all summer break, then yeah, I'm weeding you out. 
Like, you, you, if you're not taking it seriously, uh, there's not much I can do for you. Uh, but if you're keeping up with everything, so I, and I would assume that anybody who's still here, the 38 of you still here at this point right now, you're probably going to be fine. Uh, do I have advice for preparing for 22250 over winter besides studying the 115, uh, 116 material? So specifically the data structures and algorithms, that's going to help for 250 and event-based architectures, that's going to help for 220. The stack and heap, that's going to help for 220. How memory is managed, that's a big topic in 220 that um, that 220 will go much further in depth on. And 250, obviously, it's, excuse me, it's called data structures. So the data structures we covered, make sure you know those inside and out because you're going to go way deeper into those data structures in 250. Uh, if you're comfortable with all that material, you don't really have much to worry about. But if you're shaky on any of that, maybe you didn't quite understand how trees worked um in tree traversals and graphs and things like that if you're not quite sure if you're still fuzzy on stack and heap and references um you know make sure you brush up on all that stuff uh, but 116 is designed to get you ready for those next courses so just study the 116 content make sure you know inside and out if you're fuzzy on anything go back and review